Hi, my name is Dr. Amr Jory, and I'm from the Cardiovascular Imaging Network at Queen's University. In today's video, we're going to be demonstrating the goal-directed Valsalva. Now, this is an interesting modification of the conventional Valsalva. The reason why we're doing this is because sometimes you can have problems having the patient do a regular traditional Valsalva type maneuver. So the goal-directed Valsalva is a new maneuver that allows standardization of the Valsalva and allows for more accurate measurements of parameters such as the outflow tract obstruction, which you may be interested in for conditions such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So today what we're going to do is show you the equipment needed for the goal-directed Valsalva and how to perform the goal-directed Valsalva and why that can help you get more accurate measurements. I'm joined today by my medical student, Ergi Dooley. Ergi is a medical student that's been working hard in my lab, and he's going to help us demonstrate the basic equipment needed for the goal-directed Valsalva. So to perform the goal-directed Valsalva, you need very few uh, actual materials. First, you need a manual sphygmomanometer that has an analog pressure gauge so that you can see the movement of the needle when the plate patient blows it into the tube. You need a cotton ball that's going to be used to maintain sterility and protect the sphygmomanometer from any moisture that might damage it. And you'll need uh, what are called lure slip three milliliter syringes. So to put together the device for gold-directed Valsalva, what you'll first need to do is remove the pressure gauge with the tubing attached to it from the blood pressure cuff. In some devices, you can simply detach this. In others, you may have to use scissors to actually sever the connection between the two. After that, you can open your three milliliter syringe. So here I'll demonstrate the difference between the lure slip syringes and uh, on this side and the lure lock syringes that are used to twist into uh, the other opposite locking mechanism. The lure lock syringes will not fit into the tubing of the sphygmomanometer, so you have to make sure you're using the smooth-tipped syringes. What you'll then do is either use a small cotton ball or rip off a piece from a larger cotton ball, remove the plunger from the syringe, and using that plunger, you'll pack the cotton ball into the barrel of the syringe and press it down into place so that it's snugly near the end of the barrel. You may have to move it around a little bit to make sure that the cotton ball detaches. You'll secure the cotton ball at the bottom of the syringe, remove the, the plunger, and then simply place the end of or the tip of the syringe into the tubing that's connected to your sphygmomanometer. This should be a pretty snug fit, so no air will leak. And at this point, you're ready to perform the goal-directed Valsalva. I have a few questions for you, Urgi. Um, so does it matter how long the tube is? And um, does it matter what type of syringe you use? So in terms of the tubing, uh, it's not that big of a concern. You just want to be consistent at your center with the tubing you're using. This happens to be a, the rubber tubing that comes with the manometer. It's about 50 centimeters in length. Uh, but any type of tubing that can snugly fit around the tip of your syringe and the actual pressure gauge should be okay. Similarly, for the syringes themselves, you could use a 3 mil syringe or a 10 mil syringe, really as long as that tip is a smooth tip and fits snugly into the tubing of the device, you should have no problems with the patient uh, when they're blowing through the device. Thank you, Ergi. And I just wanted to clarify, so the tubing attached to the sphygmometer can be reused, and the syringe is the part that is disposable and is discarded. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, the purpose of the cotton is to actually keep the device sterile to prevent moisture and particles from the patient's breath from entering the tubing and the pressure gauge. However, the tubing is relatively cheap. And so after every couple of patients, or if the tubing is damaged in any way, you can replace it for a very small cost, just a couple of dollars. Great. And I understand that you also want to mark where you want the patient to blow to and, and sustain holding that breath. 
Can you show us how you quickly do that? Absolutely. So what we do is we take a red Sharpie um, or any color that's clearly visible to most patients, and you'll just place a mark at the 40 millimeters of mercury um, me measurement on the pressure gauge. This creates a clear target or goal for the patient to aim for when they're blowing into the spigrel manometer. And it will also allow the sonographer or the practitioner to easily see how well the patient is actually performing the maneuver. So I'm just going to provide a few extra notes about the equipment setup, as you might be wondering how you could put this together in your lab. I want to emphasize that we're using equipment that is available or components that are available in any echo lab. Um, and even a sphygmometer is available in most labs. But we did end up ordering this dedicated sphygmometer for these purposes. And uh, basically, it's, it's sort of a $40 piece. That's all you really need. And just a, a note about the tubing. We're using the original tubing that is with a sphygmometer. But you might decide to use disposable IV tubing as well and attach that if you want to even be more careful with infection control. We were finding that using the original tubing and a cotton ball in the syringe was sufficient. So a, a few notes that we learned as we used this equipment. Uh, initially, we were using our slip lock, which is a nice um, smooth tipped IV um, syringe and inserting it into the sphygmometer tubing. What we found was that when you blow into this, Sometimes you have a leak around the tubing because it's not that secure. And so we were thinking it would be nice that we could use a, a different connector. And in fact, some labs have this lure lock syringe hanging around. The problem is that with the lure lock, it also may not fit very well and there may be some leaks. So the solution we found to that was to use our stopcock. And again, this is just regular equipment that you can find in the Echo Lab. This, as you can see, is something that we, we use for agitated saline or bubble studies. So we didn't have to order any new equipment. And what we decided to do was, in fact, place this uh, stopcock onto our tubing. So I'm going to show you how to do that. It's going to take a few seconds for me to stick it in here. There we go. Um, and it, it is a bit challenging, but that's what makes it tight and snug. And now I have a stopcock that I can leave on this dedicated sphygmometer um, in my lab. Um, and now I can use either syringe and it's a very snug fit, and so there's less leakiness. So let's try that. So I'm going to grab some cotton. The other thing I learned was to not take too much cotton and to really sm roll it up into a smooth ball because then it doesn't get caught as much with your plunger. And then you can plunge it and sort of flatten it and it creates a really nice filter there to prevent any droplets from entering your equipment. And so now I'm going to connect it to my stopcock and I'm going to test it like that. As you can see, it's off to this component um, so that we're connecting to the sphygmometer. And that really does feel like an appropriate Valsalva maneuver. I'm blowing into the sphygmometer. I'm blowing as hard as I can, uh, trying to achieve 40 millimeters of mercury pressure. Now, the exact number that we achieve really doesn't matter. It's kind of like a nice guide. But, you know, some patients may not blow as hard as 40 millimeters. They might blow a little bit harder. The idea is that they're really blowing 
and performing that valsalva, bearing down and contracting, and the blowing acts as an aid to help them achieve that valsalva maneuver. So again, uh, very easy to put together a few pieces that are already in the echo lab and just getting a sphygmometer to help direct how hard you need to blow and reproduce that valsalva between scans. Here we have Casey about to begin a scan in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She's going to first demonstrate how we do the traditional valsalva maneuver. Okay, so we're going to try something now. I'd like you to stop your breath right where it is for me, and I want you to squeeze your stomach muscles in for me, nice and tight, like you're going to have a bowel movement. Okay, so stop your breath there. Squeeze up, oh, and then just let it go. That's good. Um, so we're going to try it again, and I don't want you to take a breath in. Hold your breath where it is. Squeeze your stomach muscles in nice and tight. Keep squeezing and let it all go. Um, you're still taking a little bit of a breath in. So this time I'm going to have you take a big breath in. Big breath in. Blow it all out. Breathe all the way out. Hold there. Squeeze your stomach muscles in now. Keep squeezing and then relax. Do you feel like you're squeezing your stomach muscles in there? Yeah, okay. So we're going to do it one more time. We'll take that big breath in. Breathe out. Hold it out. Squeeze your stomach muscles in. Keep squeezing. Try not to breathe in. And then let that go. So try not to take a breath in at all. Why don't we start with just take a breath in. Breathe it out. Hold your breath. Squeeze your stomach muscles in. Keep squeezing them, and then let that go. Good. As you can see, Casey was having some challenges eliciting a proper Valsalva maneuver. Not that she was positioned incorrectly. Sometimes it's difficult for a patient to understand exactly what they need to do to conduct a Valsalva. Valsalva is very important because we want to get the highest or the peak outflow tract gradient accurately. So as you can see in this example, sometimes the patient was taking a breath in too deeply and she was losing her picture. Sometimes the uh, patient was not bearing down properly or flexing their abdominal muscles. And she had to try multiple attempts to try to get a Valsalva, adding time to her procedure scan. Next, what she's going to do is try the goal-directed Valsalva. And the idea is that she would probably just go directly to the goal-directed Valsalva and avoid the multiple uh, instructions required to get the conventional Valsalva. Okay, Michael, we're going to try something a little bit different now. Um, I have this tube right here. Okay, you're going to be blowing through the tube. Okay, but I want you to hold this in your hand and you see this red line right here. Uh -huh. So I want you to blow um, through with enough pressure to get this needle to come all the way to the red line. Okay, and then when you do that, we're going to hold that for 10 seconds of you blowing in. Okay, um, and then we'll both be able to watch the needle. Okay. Are you ready to give that a try? Yeah. Okay, so I'll let you know when to do it. So I'm going to get the picture here. All right, so I'm ready. So when you are ready, just blow into that tube. Okay, and let that all go. So I didn't see that needle go towards the red there, that red line. Um, I think maybe you were just puffing your cheeks up and sort of holding the air um, in your cheeks a little bit. So what I want you to do is really try and blow the air out, okay? And we really want to watch that needle and make sure that it's going up to the red line, okay? So let's try that again when you're ready, okay? Good. So we'll count to 10 here. One, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. You can let that go. That was really great. So, as you can see, Casey was able to direct the patient to perform a more standardized valsalva by getting the patient to blow into a tube. She did notice that even with this maneuver, there was some difficulty. Initially, the patient was puffing their cheeks out rather than blowing into the tube. She was quickly able to correct the patient's performance by getting them to blow directly into the tube and to hold that breath. This allowed her to get a more standardized Valsalva Doppler profile that she felt was more accurate, providing correct information for the final report. Thank you, Casey, for that demonstration, and thank you to our patient, Michael, for allowing us to demonstrate the goal-directed Valsalva. As you can see that the goal-directed Valsalva only takes a few minutes to perform, and it uses some basic equipment that is available in your hospital. There has been a few papers now published demonstrating that the goal-directed Valsalva provides accuracy, and as we continue to gain experience with this procedure, it's likely going to become more adapted in echo labs across Canada and North America. One of the things I wanted to mention is that we have this video on the hcmresources.com website along with other resources there as well. And if you have any questions, a email can be found on that website and feel free to email us. We're happy to answer any further questions about this suggested maneuver to obtain a good Valsalva so that we can get an accurate outflow tract obstruction gradient in our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thanks for listening today.